Richard Capriola, mental health and addictions counselor and author of the book, The Addicted Child, A Parent's Guide to Adolescent, Parent's Guide to Adolescent Substance Abuse. Uh, welcome to Lunch and a Divorce Lawyer. Thank you, Peter. It's a pleasure to be here today to talk about this topic of adolescent substance abuse, which I know can be a very intimidating and sometimes frightening topic for parents raising uh, preteens and teenagers. So you're a, uh, you're a published author um, and counselor. Track us back a little, Richard, just in terms of how you how you got to where you are as an author and just kind of some of your your history as a counselor and otherwise take it wherever you want to go okay thank just, you well, just uh, just end at the present <laughs> okay uh i started out in education as a school administrator working for the uh, illinois state board of education I spent about three decades uh, working in various functions, uh, various jobs at the State Board of Education, uh, including uh, being a special assistant to the state superintendent of education. And uh, after I retired from, from that career, I uh, moved over to the mental health and substance abuse field. I started out uh, working part-time at, at a mental health crisis center noticed that a lot of people coming to our crisis center from the emergency rooms had a mental health and a substance use issue. So I returned to the University of Illinois and uh, obtained a master's degree in addictions counseling, continued to work at the crisis center, and then was offered a position at Menninger Clinic in Houston, Texas. Menninger Clinic is one of the largest psychiatric uh, hospitals in the country. So it serves both adolescents and adults diagnosed with mental health and substance abuse issues, disorders. And I worked for Menninger for a little over a decade. And after I left Menninger, I wanted to write this book, The Addicted Child, A Parent's Guide to Adolescent Substance Abuse, to be a resource for parents. And, and when I was working with parents at Menninger Clinic, I would sit across from them and I would go through their child's use of a history of, of using substances. And many times they would look across at me and they would say, I had no idea this was going on. Or if they did suspect their child was using a substance, they might say, well, I sort of knew something was going on, but I didn't think it was this bad. And and these are good, good parents, Peter. These are very good parents doing the best mm -hmm. job they can. They missed the warning signs because nobody told them what to look for. So that was the motivation to write the book. And I wanted to put in uh, very brief chapters. The book only runs about 100 pages because parents are busy. Uh, they don't have time to read lots of information on this, okay. but I wanted them to have an overview of the drugs that are out there. They know about alcohol and marijuana, but they might not know about some of these other drugs. So there's brief chapters to help help them uh, become aware of the drugs that are out there on the street. I put a chapter to help them understand how these drugs work in the adolescent developing brain and the importance of protecting that developing brain. I put uh, warning signs for alcohol and marijuana and self-injury and eating disorders because sometimes self-injury and eating disorders will accompany a child using a substance. I put in there uh, information on what treatment options are available, everything from outpatient to inpatient treatment, and how do you recognize a good inpatient treatment program? And as a parent, what questions should you be asking? Um, and then there's resources in the book too. So I tried to put all that together in a brief book that parents could read very quickly, put on the bookshelf and have as a resource and hopefully feel a little bit more confident that if they have to deal with this issue, they hope they don't, but if they have to mm -hmm. deal with this issue, they feel a little better prepared to do so. It seems like a great resource. I'm looking at the table of contents as we're talking. Uh -huh. um, chapter, let's see. <laughs> Adolescent substance use and then the brain on drugs are the first two chapters. Um, yes. Could you expound on it? I have not read the book, but I am looking at the table of contents. The uh -huh. adolescent substance abuse. Could you could you speak at a maybe a global level to start in terms of the scope of the problem? I mean, at a, at a yeah. macro societal level. Yeah, we we've known for for decades that 
uh, teenagers are attracted primarily to two substances, alcohol and marijuana. Those are the two drugs of choice that teenagers have been gravitating to for decades. Uh, prior to the pandemic, however, there was a surge, a dramatic increase in what's called vaping, vaping nicotine and vaping marijuana. Right. For three years prior to the pandemic, there was a tremendous increase in these teenagers turning to vaping. Then the pandemic came along. Well, what happened? We saw a dramatic decrease in adolescent substance abuse due to the pandemic. Kids were pulled away from school. There were many of them doing homeschooling, online classes, pulled away from their peers and their social engagements and their activities. Mm. So we saw a dramatic decline in, in substance abuse for that year. After the pandemic, what we're seeing is a rebound, a slight rebound in substance abuse, not, not to the level that it was prior to the pandemic, but starting mm -hmm. to move up again. And it'll take a while before we see, uh, before we have more data to see if their use of substances returns to the levels that it was uh, prior to the pandemic. It seems to be trending up in that direction. Um, so marijuana, alcohol, the primary substance is vaping. I would be very concerned about vaping if I was a parent. Uh, that's the vaping of nicotine and marijuana. Um, uh, so those, those primarily are the substance. We don't see a lot of, uh, of teenagers getting involved in the harder core drugs like cocaine and uh, methamphetamine. Those, those tend to be less than 5% of, of kids. Still alcohol and marijuana. If I were to compare... I feel like more of my personal experience with um, substance abuse is observing it in adults and less with adolescents and children. But what is sort of that comparative piece of like, here's what substance abuse is like and impacts on an adult versus uh a developing child and I guess a developing brain. Is that a lot of the big, I don't know, heightened concern because of the growth and brain development that's still happening in the 13-year-old? It is. It's an excellent question. There are two differences between uh, adult addiction and adolescent addiction. And the first one is what you just mentioned, brain development. Our brains get fully developed around age 24, 25. So mm -hmm. an adult uh, who, who's addicted to a substance has a fully developed brain. Uh, an adolescent, on the other hand, who's using a substance, their brains are, are, are in the process of maturing and developing and forming those critical connections that they will need later in adulthood. So the first big difference in, in addiction between adults and adolescents is, is brain development adult brain fully developed, adolescent brain developing. The second difference is in consequences. Adults who are addicted, uh, unfortunately, often face catastrophic consequences. They might have lost a family. They might have lost a marriage. They might have uh, lost their job. They might have been incarcerated. These are, these are catastrophic consequences that, sadly, many adults who are addicted face. Adolescents, on the other hand, they face very few catastrophic consequences. Their biggest consequence is their parent coming down on them or grounding them, but nowhere near the consequences that an adult addict may face in their life, which can be catastrophic and, and destructive. So two big differences, brain development, consequences. And on the consequences, um... Why do you think, why is that? I mean, maybe in a sense, if you're, you know, I'm just talking generically a 50 year old with a successful business and, a, and you're married and, you know, I, I'm just saying like worldly examples of success, you know, just for what it's worth. Um, are there not consequences being put on the 13 year old or is it, is it how we, how we're, I don't know what, I, I'm just trying to get at that. Um, because at that age, we should be at more, we're, we're treating the problem more or what, um, unpack that, the consequence difference. Well, again, the consequences are that um, the adult who is addicted 
Um, and by addicted, I mean the drug has basically consumed their life. You know, it has more control over them than they have over the drug. And the consequences, uh, unfortunately, can be catastrophic. Um, adolescents, on the other hand, you know, they, they're not employed, they're not married, they don't have a family other than, you know, their, their, their immediate family. Um, so their consequences are, are, are tend to be far less. Now, that's not to say that the consequences can't be destructive. Certainly, they can mm -hmm. overdose, they can get into an accident, they can harm themselves. These can be dangerous consequences. But in general, a, a, an adult who has been fighting an addiction for years, maybe decades, often is facing much more severe consequences, um, you know, uh, than, than an adolescent who has maybe been using substances for a year or two, and they get in trouble with their family. It can get worse, they can get in trouble with the law, they can get in trouble with school, they can be suspended. So those, those can be major consequences too. But adults uh, tend to ha have more catastrophic consequences, being incarcerated as an example, or or, or losing their marriage through divorce. Um, right. Uh, so uh, somewhat of a difference between adolescents and adults. The decrease in substance uh, abuse over the pandemic yeah. uh, a lay person such as myself would look around and say you know there was, I don't know, loneliness and, and, and mental illness and anxiety that occurred during the pandemic. And, and yet the substance abuse in adolescence decreased dramatically. Uh, why is that? Is it because I'm not around my friends who are providing the substances or is that just a totally simplistic no, that's a, that's a big part of it. I think that uh, during that year of the pandemic, when things were closed down, uh, people were um, were isolating, uh, schools were um, were shut down, kids were forced to do online learning, they were at home, and they weren't interacting as often with their peers. So I think their access to drugs was significantly curtailed. Mm -hmm. um, and now that they're back in school, we're starting to see the trend go back up, which means their access to drugs is, is, has, has gotten, uh, they have more access to drugs. In terms of mental health, we have known for over a decade that we are facing a mental health crisis among the adolescent population and even the adult population. But we've right. known for over a decade that mental health has been a crisis in this country. Uh, the pandemic did make it worse. Uh, kids were isolated. They were at home. Uh, we, we saw an increase in anxiety. We saw an increase in depression. Uh, we saw an increase in their, uh, actually a decrease in their sleeping ability. So, you know, the, in addition to having an effect on substance use, the pandemic had a negative effect on adolescent, subs, uh, adolescent mental health. Also had a negative effect on adult mental health too, because many sure. adults were going through a crisis and many of them lost their jobs. Many of them were working at home. Many of them were fearful for their health. So the pandemic across the board increased mental health crisis, but adolescents, they've been going through a mental health crisis for over a decade. Is, is substance abuse and usage uh, in adolescents oftentimes, would you say, the effect of, of, of the mental health crisis or how do you kind of parse those out a little bit I, I i i talk about why do some kids turn to using substances mm -hmm. and every kid is different you know every every kid is different some get involved with substances because of curiosity. You know, they've heard about marijuana. They want to try it. They want to see what it's like. They either have a good experience or a bad experience with it. Uh, some of them uh, get introduced because of their uh, peers, the kids they're hanging around with. They want to. They mm -hmm. want to. You know, be part of the peer group. The peer groups using drugs or, or drinking alcohol. They're more likely to join in. 
And then for some kids, not all, but for some adolescents, some kids, there is an underlying mental health issue why that child is using a substance. Um, they are using a substance to medicate an underlying psychological issue. It might be anxiety, it might be depression, it might be an emerging personality disorder. Um, it could be any of the mental health disorders. Um, the example um, that I would share with you is that when I was working with teenagers at Menninger Clinic, I would ask them, why are you smoking so much marijuana? And the number one answer that came back was it helps me with my anxiety. So mm -hmm. for some kids, they are using a substance to medicate an underlying issue. And unfortunately, uh, in too many cases, those underlying issues go undiagnosed. We catch and we try to treat the substance use, but we miss and don't diagnose and treat the underlying issue like anxiety or depression or, or maybe some type of trauma. Uh, so, so for many kids, a lot of kids, they're using a substance to medicate that underlying issue so they feel better. On the parent side, um, maybe we could talk a little bit about kind of what to be looking for if you have these concerns or just in general, right? You have, you know, freshman in high school daughter or whatever. I'm just using personal example because um, I know even going way back, this is a funny but true story, sort of funny. You might, I don't, I don't know, as a substance abuse and mental health counselor, you might think I have a problem, but one time in my life, I um, I got drunk and it was like when I was in junior high. And to this day, we sort of laugh about it as a family because my mother was totally clueless to actually what was happening. Yeah. So that's my funny segue into, I think that general concept is a problem. Is it not sort of like what to look for and kind of to be educated as a parent, to be on alert, so to speak. It, it is, and it's the motivation, the primary motivation why I wrote my book was to give parents the warning signs because, you know, they, they, many times they don't know what to look, what to look out for. Um, and, and it is important that they have some information about, you know, what the warning signs are. Um, so I have warning signs for alcohol use, marijuana use, um, self-injury, eating disorders, which can accompany a child using a substance use. Uh, as a general rule, what I say to parents is pay attention to the changes that you see in your child. Don't assume that the changes that you're seeing are just normal adolescent acting out behaviors. They might very well be that, but they might also be an indication that there's something else going on underneath the surface that you need to pay attention to. Some examples would be a child whose grades are starting to decline, uh, a child who used to enjoy and participate in extracurricular activities no longer shows an interest or desire to do so. Um, a child who uh, used to introduce you to their friends, you knew who their friends were, becomes very secretive of who their friends are, mm. becomes very secretive of where they've been and what they've been doing. Um, now, if these signs sort of come and go fairly quickly, it's probably not too concerning, but if they linger on and on, and then you begin to see more and more of these signs, then it's probably a good idea to get the assessments done that I recommend in my book, so that you can get a professional to take a look at the issues and advise you as to whether or not there's an issue there, if there's a diagnosis, and if so, what, what are the best treatment options for you? And then obviously, if you you find any paraphernalia around the house, you smell any strange orders, orders uh, those are obvious clues that, that maybe something's going on. Um, also to parents, I say, if you have any liquor at home, if uh, that needs to be secured, if you have uh, medicines at home, over-the-counter prescription medications, those need to be secured uh, because uh, some teenagers are very clever. They will get into that medicine cabinet and they'll take just a few pills uh, and you probably wouldn't even know that they're missing. I think you referenced alcohol, marijuana, and vaping as perhaps the top three. I mean, if we bulleted each one of those, you know, 
kind of um, characteristics or things to look out for for a adolescent using, you know, those three or, you know, separated them out, what, what should I be looking for, you know, if I have concerns about alcohol use? Well, again, make sure that if you have alcohol at home, that it's secured. The kids aren't mm -hmm. getting into it. I had uh, one young man who would raid the, uh, the liquor cabinet and would uh, take uh, a little bit of vodka and replace it with water. Eventually, mm. his, uh, his, his, his parents caught on to that one. Um, but it's important that you secure any medications, over-the-counter and prescription medications and any alcohol, just so it's not easily accessible to your child. Um, and I would say that, you know, again, pay attention to the warning signs, pay attention to the behaviors of your child, notice anything that seems a little bit unusual, become curious about it, and then, um, and then have conversations with your child, you know, have, be, be, be inquisitive, be curious about what you're seeing and, and, and try to have conversations with your child about things that you might be concerned about. Yeah, um, vaping, marijuana. Um, is there is there particular I don't know groups of of people by gender or demographic that go are more likely to be abusing specific drugs, or what's the breakdown look like there, or is there one? I, I you know, again, the, the the popular drugs are marijuana, vaping, and and then alcohol. Um, mm -hmm. There is a slight difference between uh, boys and girls. Uh, uh, girls tend to abuse one substance, whereas boys are more likely to abuse multiple substances. Um, but in terms of you know the drugs themselves, I don't think uh, I don't think there's any preference one way or the other between the sexes. In our in in my law practice, we represent you know parents, and sometimes I frankly I'm appointed to represent children in divorce and child custody cases. Mm -hmm. um, do you did did you or do you see you know children in sort of these crises families being maybe particularly susceptible to turning to different um, you know drugs or substance abuse? Well, it can be a factor because obviously mm -hmm. they are caught in an environment that can be, you know, very traumatic. Uh, it can be a, a very, a lot of anxiety going on. Um, and, and I think a lot has to do with how the parents are handling any disagreements that they might have. Um, you know, if they're going through a divorce, you know, how is the child affected by that? What type of help is the child getting as they go through that divorce procedure? So a, a lot has to do with the environment in which the child is living and, and, and how that child is reacting to the changes within that environment. It can be a risk factor, no doubt. If I look at the full, I don't know, age range of of a of a of a young person or a minor, um, particular times or ages that substance abuse tends to start or be most prevalent. Well, it can I, start. And, it can yeah. start in preteen years, uh, and typically, mm -hmm. what what we notice in the preteen years is a a. a chance that they might get into what we call inhalants. Uh, these are vapors, you know, things like gasoline, glue, things like that. Many household products that we keep around the house have right. these vapors to them. And uh, pre-teenagers, if they're going to get involved in something, are more likely to get involved with, with trying an inhalant, which can be very dangerous and very toxic to the brain. As they get older, I would say once they enter into the middle school years and the high school years, then I think they're more prone to being attracted to things like uh, nicotine, uh, alcohol, marijuana, and vaping uh, as they enter into middle school and high school years. What's um, uh, uh, just sort of as we wrap wrap the episode here, Richard, sort of a best piece of advice for a person if I'm starting to have concerns and observe things that you've described, 
um, changes, maybe antisocial behavior, mm -hmm. what should I do? The first thing I would recommend you do is have a conversation with your child. And by mm -hmm. that, I mean, don't accuse the child, don't threaten the child, don't punish the child. You want to come at that discussion with an inquiring point of view, with the focus being on you. In other words, I'm concerned that you might be smoking marijuana. I'm concerned that you might be drinking alcohol and that scares me. Can you help me understand why I'm feeling this way? So you want to invite the child into a conversation about how you're feeling about what you're suspecting might be going on and see if the child will share information with you. Now, quite frankly, that's a discussion that's likely to go one of two ways. It's either going to blow up and the child's going to become argumentative and defensive, which tells you something, or you might learn something from the conversation. But regardless of how those conversations go, if you're still concerned as a parent that your child might be using a substance, you need to move to the next stage, which is to get the assessments done that I recommend in my book. You want to get a physical physical exam to rule out if there's anything physically going on with your child. You'll want to get an addictions assessment to see what drugs they've been using, how often they've been using them, and whether it is a, a, a diagnosis, a diagnosis uh, if, if, if one's warranted. And you'll want to get a psychological assessment to rule in or rule out if there's any of these underlying mental health issues that your child might be struggling with and using a substance to medicate. Um, so you want to make sure that if you're concerned as a parent, you get these professional assessments done. And the starting point for those would be a referral I, from my primary care physician or I would I would recommend that you start with your school counselor, your mm -hmm. school so social worker, or your school psychologist. Any of those three will be do able to do uh, some of these preliminary assessments for you. And, uh, and if not, they can refer you to other professionals in the community that can get these assessments done. So as a parent, I would recommend that if you have concerns, have a discussion with the school psychologist, the school social worker, or the school counselor as your first step. Oh, great, great. Because yeah, I feel like people you know, there's parts of the parts of society who might not be as entrenched in kind of the private medical world. So, yeah, you know, hopefully, I mean, I mean, I can think of definitely a few cases we have right now where, you know, kind of the starting point of under sort of figuring out a child in crisis, or actually I'm thinking of one where the child was having conflict with the other parent because the parent was beginning to abuse alcohol again, really did start with a conversation with the school social worker. So yeah. that um, was very effective in the, in the situation I'm, I'm thinking about here. So, um, so Richard, uh, where can people grab a copy of your book, The Addicted Child? I would suggest they go to the book's website which is www.helptheaddictedchild.com, helptheaddictedchild.com. When they get to the website, they can read endorsements, they can read reviews, they can read a sample chapter. There's some blog articles they might find interesting. And there's a link that will take them to Amazon where the book is available as a Kindle for people who like to read on a Kindle. And it's also available in paperback. And um, the book is... Your ideal reader or customer would be a parent of adolescent children. Is that stating the obvious or who I, else? I think it would be any family member. Could be aunt, uncle, grandparents, anybody uh, concerned about adolescent substance abuse. Uh, and the age range would be pre-teenager all the way through adolescent years, high school. Um, but any family member that 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 wants to to learn about this, I I think one of the dangers, uh, Peter, is that um, par parents too often think this can't happen to my child. This happens to other children. This doesn't happen to my child. Um, and and unfortunately, there is no child that's totally protected. There are protective mm -hmm. environments, but no right. child is totally protected. Doesn't matter what your religion doesn't matter where you live urban suburban rural doesn't matter right. your level of income 
all children are susceptible. And other than jumping on podcasts and um, what else are what else are you doing with yourself these days, Richard? Are you actively you're retired from Menninger Clinic? Yeah. I was just curious. Are you uh, are you all, are you doing other things sort of specific to substance abuse counseling um, beyond the the book? No, I've, I've been spending the last year, you know, doing interviews and podcasts to get the word okay. out uh, about the book. Aside from that, uh, now that uh, my wife is retired also, so we're uh, doing a little bit more traveling uh, around the country. We have family on both the East Coast and the West Coast. Um, so we, uh, we're trying to do a little bit more traveling uh, now that we're both retired. Um, but um, I'm, I'm mostly have been doing podcasts to get the word out about this book and then traveling with my wife. And that seems to be my life these days. Yeah, doesn't sound half bad. So yes, last time, the, thank you again for joining us and just tease it out one more time. The um, Your website is www.helptheaddictedchild.com. All right. Good, uh, good web address there. Thanks again for joining us, Richard. Be well. Thank, thank you, Peter. Appreciate you uh, taking the time to talk to me.